Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to the second installment of our Darth Bane book trilogy, book study. Uh, said that weird. <clears throat> anyway, uh, welcome to everybody here and we will get started in a moment, but uh, let me do welcome the chat. I don't know, let's see how far back my chat goes here. I set the stream up a little bit earlier today. But I do think Melissa Harrison Sons was first. I do see her there. Welcome, Melissa Harrison Sons. Great to see you and your sons here with us. Wolf 10 Media, great to see you. Just wrapped up your stream. Awesome. Great to have you. Horizon Talker, good to see you. Morgan T. Dilliman, hail. <laughs> Samuel Proctor, uh, let's see. Daniel Heron, always good to have you there. And Zetopia, welcome. That looks like everybody who's active in the chat, but we clearly have many more watching. So that's great to have. And my dear, dear sound engraver. Saved you for last because you're special. <laughs> says, hello there, everyone. Proudly refuted the Star Wars Twitter page. Looks like the new female character was affirmed by Clone Trooper Rex. I had to respond. I got an Ahsoka lover upset. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, she, she sent me the the, uh, the 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 post that she responded to and her response. And yeah, all of the main characters, all of the beloved characters have to be drawn in so that they can kneel before your new female character. You know, you're like, uh, you're unlike any clone I've ever seen before. Oh, Ray, you're so amazing. You could fix the Millennium Falcon and you could shoot everybody out of the sky and blah, blah, blah. You know, anyway. Uh, okay. Looks like I've left my co-host in the green room for a bit too long. Wookiees get very upset if you ignore them. So your girl causing problems on Twitter. I see <laughs> she's a troublemaker <laughs> that she must be. I like, I like my mischievous, uh, sound engraver. So it's pretty cute. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> so how are you uh, doing, sir? I'm well. I'm well. I'm ready to delve into these chapters. There's a lot here. It's good stuff, too. So uh, I actually did just finish up recording the video for my workshop. You know, people who took advantage of my writing workshop on story beginnings. That lecture video is going out in an hour or two after the stream. So uh, and then they're going to be busy writing out their drafts to send me within a week. So uh, so that's a lot of fun. So people, if you're watching and you didn't know about my workshop or you sounds like something you want in on, I will put my email in the uh in the chat there again you are welcome to to write me and uh you, you know it's okay if people join up a little late because you know there's, there's you're not going to affect anybody i'll just put you in the schedule kind of on a rolling basis here but you can email me for the for the details and the price and everything like that and i'll uh, be happy to happy to oblige if anybody missed it and wants to jump in so there is my email how are you doing sir I am doing very well i've been in a very good mood since yesterday morning because for the first time in over a decade, I got to interact with dogs. Oh, really? Did somebody bring dogs to the place you're at there? One, one of my neighbors has has a couple dogs, a, oh. a, a little Scottish Terrier and a little Cairn Terrier. And <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't say Cairn Terrier, by the way. He said Cairn Terrier. <laughs> Cairn. Cairn. <laughs> it's got no, short little blonde hair and it yips at you a lot. <laughs> exactly. Exactly what it. And hey, that's what this dog was that's like. That's what a Karen does. <laughs> and her, and uh, her um, her human her human mother uh, basically <laughs> basically said that's just her wanting attention and wanting to like you know be petted. And I sat down and just you know kind of petted her and Sandy and Cassie. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice! And they were the cutest little things. But yeah, Sandy was Sandy was a yipper. She loved. She was. Uh, Begging, begging for love. Everybody walked by. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> well, dogs are always cute. They're always good to lift your spirit yeah. too, especially if you don't have to clean up after them. Oh yeah, that's, yeah. That's, what, that's especially you know, I, good. I do dearly love dogs, but I, you know, if, if and I, and I've, I've had dogs, and I, I wouldn't mind having a dog again. You know, Santa Graver always talks about wanting to get a dog one day, but I'm a cat guy. If you gave me a, a, a choice, you know, right now, dog or cat, you have to have one. Definitely be a cat. And it's because this uh, Zoltan is this uh, stand-up comedian. I forget his last name, but his first name is Zoltan, I believe. But he talks about, he said, uh, he, I say, he say, I say I like cats. And people go, oh, what do you, you don't like dogs? He's like, no, no, that doesn't mean I don't like dogs. He says, you know, I love dogs. Dogs are great. You know, I'll, uh, I, I like dogs. And then I just like other people's dogs, you know, <laughs> where, where they uh -huh. play with them a little bit. And then they go back over there, you know, go back over there. And he talks about how he, that nervous energy, like somebody in your face, like, hey, man, I love you. Let's go outside and play. You know, just. Well, yeah, not into that. <laughs> cats, cats kind of do their own thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said. He said, "I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I don't need a, 
I don't need a best friend. I just need like an apathetic roommate. So I'm like, sometimes I like to hang out. That's a cat. <laughs> yeah. Now, Hermione, my cat, she was always, always wanting to play for me. Uh oh, Santa Grace is careful, Prof. Daniel's here. I know. Daniel, he's unsubscribing right now and writing hate mail as we speak. Daniel's a big dog guy. And uh, has, he's, he's Daniel lives the lifestyle. He's got a lot of cat hounds there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a little bit. <laughs> We, uh, I, I'm sure you will mind saying we had a little discussion today. Does a wolf count as a dog? Oh yeah, he was asking me that too. Yeah, I said yeah. no. I said he could do it for what he's what he's thinking about there. I'll let him announce it, but well, I think it works I for mean, what he's thinking about. I, I I did say he could make a better case for a wolf being like for for a certain movie being a dog movie than, <laughs> than uh, Die Hard being a Christmas movie. That's so, true. Uh, uh, that his, was my concession to him. His answer to this whole discussion is to super chat me $2 so I have to put it up on the screen. Then what yeah. she says, dogs. Yeah. <laughs> well played, sir. Well played. Mm -hmm. I, like, um, I, like, I like them all, but like I said, I like other people, so I don't want to clean up the mess or anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dig into the story, shall we? So uh, I did forget I to put the link forget. to this again. I, I need to put the link for people who want to buy their own copy and follow along. I put it a few streams ago or whatever, but I'll drop it in afterwards. So I'll fix it in the description. So, speaking of digging into this book, I am digging this book. I know you said I'm that. I'm really enjoying it. I don't, I don't know what it. I'm just kind of, I'm just really into the story. I think, I think uh, it was like the break taking that little break kind of refreshed my mm -hmm. wanting to dive back into the universe. You again. missed it. You wanted to start reading again. Look what I've done to you. Mm. <laughs> and I love the audio because you get all the sound and the music and oh, it's awesome. Yeah. I um, occasionally I'll listen to the audio. If, if I know it's, a, I'm just not going to have time that week or whatever doing the, uh, so I have listened to this book all the way through audio before in previous times and it, it they do a great job. This was from an era where they were really just producing these Star Wars books really well. Uh, some of Jonathan Davis, I think, is the narrator who does this one, the same guy who did the Obi-Wan or the Kenobi book. Mm -hmm. But uh, between him and, um, oh, man, who's the famous guy that does all the voices so well that did uh, that did the Thrawn trilogy? Blanking Sorry. on his name now. But he was great. You know, he, he's famous in Star Wars communities for being able to do all these voices. But, yeah, they do a good job production, music, sound effects, mm -hmm. and everything. So we left off with uh, an important kind of cliffhanger last time with the end of chapter five. And that was Des on the planet of Apatros, the mining planet of Apatros there. And he was, uh, he had just been, he had just killed a Republic soldier. Didn't really mean it was dark and they were trying to kill him, trying to hurt him. And he, and he like defending himself against the viral blade and it ended up in the, in the Republic uh, soldier's chest. So he knew he was going to be hunted down for this. And probably sent to a prison world. And he didn't want all this. So Groshik, the the Nimodian, Nimodian cantina owner, helps him to escape and become a uh, a Sith soldier because he can't join the Republic. That's out of the question. They're looking for him. And he says, uh, "Well, you know, you can you can become a Sith." And he tells him something that's uh, where is it? Um, he tells him something before he leaves him. He says, "Why didn't I? Did I, I thought it would have underground under under." line this uh there won't be next time your life here is over Let's see. it's when he tells him that you can't count on anybody uh all, all you've got is yourself look out for yourself you can't trust anybody um uh, i thought i'd underline that but now i can't find it live here i'll probably find it as i'm talking but these words are going to come back to to haunt Des and and, and uh, shape him, you know. Even though, as we said last time, Groshik himself actually is somebody selflessly helping another, and we don't really know why. Uh, but those words shape Des, and that I've got to look out for myself. No one's going to look after look out for me. It's just uh, you know, it's just me or it's nobody. You know, that's the idea. So um, we have here the, the uh, jump in time. We left Des stowing away on a smuggling ship snowing away on a smuggling ship and then we um then we have uh, a time jump and now des has been in the sith army for quite a while tonight we're going to finish out a trio 
of inst of beginnings for Des. So we we began with Des on the mining planet. He'd been on the mining planet long before we came along and joined him there. And now we're seeing him as a Sith soldier. And again, the time jump is he's been there for a while. We don't see him begin there. We just see him there finding his place. And then the thirdly, we're going to get to in just a little bit, his entering into the Jedi, or not Jedi, the Sith Academy. And we're going to talk about what the, you know, what that looks like and, and, and why we actually get him from the start there. It's interesting. So we have these three sets of, of beginnings or origins for, um, for Des, or Bane, as he'll be called in a moment here. But at this point in Chapter 6, he's made it up to the rank of a sergeant. And he's really thriving in this lifestyle as a Sith soldier. Mm -hmm. You think about his background, coming from a planet, a mining planet of Apatros, everybody is, is trying to take you out. It's a com competition. Um, he is for himself. He had to fight for everything he owned and so forth. Now he's in the army, you know, in the, in the Sith military here. And there's a sense of, of community and belonging there suddenly. And he actually responds to this. He actually kind of thrives in this a little bit. And as you're reading it, you're kind of thinking, if only it was the Republic Army, then I could root for you. You know, <laughs> but it's the Sith. But once again, uh, Carpishan does the cool trick. And I said, one way you can make somebody root for a villain who's a protagonist, but not make them sympathetic or want the protagonist to succeed the way you do that is make the people around him even more despicable, so much more despicable than that protagonist is. Right. You know, yeah. and that's what we do in this situation with his lieutenant, uh, Ad no, Ad Adnar. Um, Adnar is his friend. Who's the lieutenant's name? Oh, do you remember? Um, it was something. Ulabor. Uh, Ulabor. Yeah. Ulabor. Yeah. So, uh, um, go ahead. I I do want to say one thing. I really I I don't I don't know. It, it just struck me as being a very interesting trait. When as high as he's risen, as as good as he as he is, when he talked about the his weapon, mm -hmm. and he's like a lot of people by by the time he's reached what he has, will switch to a a, a better weapon. Mm -hmm. But it was the, this is the first one I've learned. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm good at. I'm used to it. And if you just take time to take care of it and calibrate it every little bit it's fine and it's almost like the same thing with it's almost like the opposite of when he was on the mining planet when everything just broke down and it had to be thrown they didn't even worry about fixing it but now he's got something he's taking care of it and he's learned how to use it he can fix it i don't, I don't know why it's just it's just i kind of like that that's actually i'm really impressed that you brought that up because you, you haven't quite made it there but you're on the path to making a point here that i was going to make there's some parallelism here. We meet him on Apatros. We first see him with a piece of technology. Mm -hmm. It's a dated piece of technology, and it causes him some trouble. And then we see uh, he's doing well. He's thriving, you know, in, in as difficult as the surroundings are. And it's somebody else that comes and makes things difficult for him. Well, it's the same thing here. We see him. We open with him cleaning and checking his weapon. His hands move with quick confidence, born of a thousand repetitions as he breaks down the weapon, checks the power pack checks it all forth and he does say he could have requested a better model but the tc-22 was the first weapon he'd learned to fire that he'd become pretty good with it so we have carpishans following the same little pattern here uh repeating this to kind of build a theme for us on apatros he he had a situation there where he was not comfortable but he was doing it he was succeeding but somebody else came in and made it difficult for him here mm -hmm. he's actually quite he's thriving quite a bit and enjoying himself and, he, and he's once again with a piece of technology that's dated uh, so that we're going to see that come back and how that plays out through the story as well. But somebody else, Lieutenant Ulabor, comes in and makes it difficult for him. Mm -hmm. As we find out, as we go through, he loves soldier life. It hadn't taken him long to grow fond of the soldiers uh, in the military. He found his true place. He belonged here with his troops, his troops. But that lieutenant makes things difficult. So uh, they, they, because of their success with Des there, helping them along with his force mm -hmm. cognition, you know, things that he can kind of see before they happen with the force. This really helps him along in their missions. They become known as the gloom walkers, his troop, his unit there. And they're sent in for special, special tactics. And it's because of Dez's uh, leadership and, and machinations that makes the, the unit so, uh, so successful, but the Lieutenant gets all the glory and never tells anybody that it was Dez. He does at least uh, promote Dez to Sergeant, but there's some tension there. We already see. And here they're on Kashyyyk, and they're about to infiltrate this Republic base on Kashyyyk, but 
they need to be the ones to go in and clear uh, clear this little outpost first so that the Sith can actually send in all of their people. They need to clear the outpost before the, the Republic soldiers are able to radio for reinforcements. Well, no, no, no. They're not on Kashyyyk. They, they were on Kashyyyk at one time. I think he was remembering a battle on Kashyyyk that went sideways. Are you sure? I know that he was remembering one battle. Yeah. No, I no. Reinforcements were sent in from Kashyyyk. Yeah. They're on Fasira. Fasira, thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, Fasira. Yeah. Uh, P H A. Yeah. All right. So same, same, um, same situation I just described, but just different planet. Got the planet wrong. Right. All right. So, um, so Fasira, they've got to clear out this outpost before the Republic soldiers are able to radio in. Well, Lieutenant Ulibor comes and tells them, "Okay, we're going to march basically now, um, in the daylight. You know, when they're actually going to be able to have visibility. It's basically a suicide mission." And, mm -hmm. and uh, he says, "These were the orders from on high." Des tells him, no, you have to radio. You have to tell them that that's not going to work, that you know, these, this is a suicide mission. Um, and Ulibor refuses to do it. Part of it's a little bit of pride because this upstart Des is trying to tell them off again. And he says, uh, no, it, it's... Um... So Des eventually ends up just decking him, cocks him cold. I love the way this is written, too, because remember, we've got Des. He does act out of emotion, fear, power, uh, anger, but he, he's logical about it. So I'll read you the paragraph. Suddenly it was clear to Des what was really going on. Ulibor knew the order was a mistake, but he was too scared to do anything about it. The order must have come directly from the Dark Lords. Ulibor would rather lead his troops into slaughter than face the wrath of a Sith Master. But Dez wasn't about to let him drive the Gloomwalkers to their doom. This wasn't going to become a repeat of Hashkor, Kashyyyk. He hesitated for only a second before slamming his fist into his lieutenant's chin, knocking him cold. <laughs> There's stunned silence, of course. But the whole unit is there with Des. He tells them, look, you can lock me up now for court martial me and go, um, you know, revive him and complete this mission. Or you can do things my way. And he's thinking is that if we're successful with this mission, Ulibor will get another, you know, credit on his sleeve there, you know, or um, credential. So he won't, you know, report Des. That's his thinking. And then we move into chapter seven where the actual uh, procedure is about to happen. So Des is there. Uh, we're, we're, we're scoping out the outpost. They need to clear it before the sunrise. They need to clear it in, in, in time and, and stealthily. And he's there looking at the the gunners, the snipers, you know, that are there defending it. And he says um, he gets a little fear. So uh, as he stared across the clearing at the three repulsor crafts sitting on the launching pad atop the outpost roof, Des felt a familiar feeling in the pit of his stomach. All soldiers felt the same thing going into battle, whether they admitted it or not. Fear. Fear of failure, fear of dying, fear of watching their friends die, fear of being wounded and living out the rest of their days crippled or maimed. The fear was always there, and it would devour you if you let it. Des knew how to turn that fear to his own advantage. Take what makes you weak and turn it into something that makes you strong. Transform the fear into anger and hate. Hatred of the enemy, hatred of the Republic and the Jedi. The, Jedi. the hate gave him strength, and the strength brought him victory. He's without. He doesn't even know the Sith code yet that we've learned from the old Republic games and whatnot. But he's he's basically recounting it almost there. You know, it's, it's, he'll learn it in a little bit. It's, it's his own. It's his own personal. Like he 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 is basically meant to be he, a Sith. He is mm -hmm. a Sith mind, body, and soul right now. Yeah, without, he's, he's without any training. Exactly, he's Force sensitive. So that's mm -hmm. something that he's got naturally. But he's also naturally inclined to the dark side of the force. Mm -hmm. These are the things that this is the way he uses it, you know. So um he's got this this uh new soldier, Lucia, who's a sniper on his unit. He asks her, Would you be able to take out all of those different gunners in different places? And she says, That's impossible. I, no one can do that. No one. I certainly can't, no way could. So he's looking her out there, and he, but he's got to take them out quickly before this, you know, the sunrise. They're up against time. This is the situation because he's looking through his own rifle. He's looking through the scope, taking the sniper rifle from Lucia, or looking through hers, rather, uh, brought the weapon up and set it to his eye to scope to get a better look at the situation. He scanned the roof quickly from side to side, noting the position of every Republic soldier with the magnification of the scope. He could make out their features clear enough to see their lips moving as they spoke. The situation was practically hopeless. The outpost was the key to taking Facera, and the turrets on the roof were the key to taking the outpost. But Dez was out of options and almost out of time. He felt the, he felt the fear stronger than ever and took a deep breath to focus his mind. 
Adrenaline began to pump through his veins as he redirected the fear to give him strength and power. He lined the blaster scope up on one of the gunners and a red veil fell across his vision. Then he fired. He acted on instinct, moving too quickly to let his conscious thoughts get in the way. He didn't even see the first soldier drop. The scope was already moving to the next target. The second gunner had just enough time to open his wide, eyes wide and surprised before Des fired and moved on to the third. But the third had seen the first one go down, so the third one's running. So he's 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 taking over in this like force uh, focus, you know, uh, trance, just taking out all these soldiers. He does end up taking them all out. At one point, one of the soldiers drops a flash canister, knowing that a that a, uh, a sniper is clearly taking them out. So a sniper would have the magnification of a scope. You put off a flash canister, that'll fry their retinas. As it does, uh, Lucia, the, the sniper next to him, says, Flash Canada, Lucia, Lucia screamed, but her warning came too late. The view for the scope vanished in a brilliant white flare, temporarily blinding Des. But with his vision gone, he could suddenly see everything clearly. He knew the position of every soldier, even as they all scrambled for cover. He could track exactly where they were and where they were going. So, you know, it's like Luke having to put on the helmet so he can, you know, mm -hmm. see where the where the uh, little training pot, pot module is, is blasting him and whatnot. Um, <laughs> Also like Star Wars Rebels with um, Kanan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being he blind, like, right. Yeah, he, he got blinded, but he eventually he didn't need his eyes. He was able to see it through the force. Yeah, or to keep with the EU theme, um, Master, uh, oh shoot, Col Colto? Master Colto, I think, um, or something like that. It, from, uh, from uh, man, I'm blanking on so many names tonight. <laughs> the Apprentice mm -hmm. in the video games, the Darth Vader's Apprentice. Um, I'm blanking on the name of the, even the games. It's so sad. I, I've got so many things in my brain right now. But the Master Colto, I think, is his name, and he's also blinded and uh, can see a lot of things. Uh, Ram Coda, Coda, not Colto. Colto is the Colto tank. Coda, Ram Coda, yeah, from the video games. Um, so they finish the procedure, the the uh, the the uh, the operation. It's great. They uh, oh, Kraya too. Kraya is also blind. Yeah, Star Killer. Yeah, so they, um, yeah, Starkiller was the, the apprentice's name. So they uh, they finished the operation, they're successful, but they get back to where they had Ulibor there, and they he had put two of the new recruits there to watch Ulibor. Well, the new recruits had just cut Ulibor free as soon as he woke. He says, did you really think those raw recruits would keep their commanding officer trussed up like some kind of prisoner? And uh, he, he basically is going to send off uh, Dez to, to be court-martialed. And Dez, it, it, Ulibor stepped up and slapped him once across the face, then spit on his boots and stepped back. Take him away, he said to the enforcers, turning his back on Dez. Dez says he could have killed him. Right there in that moment, I could kill him. Of course, the enforcers would take me out, but at least I know Ulibor's out. But he says, nope, he's not worth wasting my life on. So again, being logical. And he mm -hmm. says, as uh, Dez was taken away, he couldn't help but see the look in the eyes of Lucia and the troopers whose lives he'd saved only hours ago. He had a feeling the next time the unit went into combat, <laughs> Ulibor would suffer an unfortunate and fatal accident. The realization <laughs> brought the hint of a smile to his lips. <laughs> I love that. It reminded me of Animal House. Oh, wow. Remember, remember the, there was the one guy at the end that said he was killed by his own troops? In, oh, I never in, watched yeah, Animal um, House, but that sounds oh, vaguely familiar. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so... um. Niedermeyer, that was the character's name, Niedermeyer in mm. Animal House. This 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 uh, situation here with the Gloomwalkers, with Des as a Sith soldier, is probably about as sympathetic as Des ever actually gets. Because even though he is thinking about his own hide, he's also looking out for his soldiers there. You know, you can see if you were ever going to look back at at uh, Bane's trajectory through the through the trilogy and find a moment at which he could have been saved possibly this would be it um i would argue that he couldn't really have been saved he was fighting for the sith he wouldn't have fought for the republic he doesn't like the jedi and what they stand for and stuff like that but if you had to find one one moment i'll get you turn your headphones down a little bit there al sorry that's good um now he's brought away he's brought away put uh in prison and there's this dark figure that does come to uh to take him away one of the dark lords he realizes one of the brotherhood He's uh he's taken away to a different planet. He's transferred, and then this dark uh, uh a woman comes to get him and takes him to this uh this 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 main figure who came to to look at him before ends up being Lord Kopej, one of the one of the dark lords of the Brotherhood. And he's starting to question Des, and he says, "Do you know why you're here?" Finally, and Des starts to get it. He's like, "This isn't a court martial." He says, "I, I feel like I'm being chosen for something." 
And uh, and he talks to him. He asks him about the Jedi. He asks him about the Force. And he says, um, you have seen many battles, but you have not experienced the real war. While troops vie for control of worlds and moons, the Jedi and Sith Masters seek to destroy each other. We are being driven toward an inevitable and final confrontation. The faction that survives, Sith or Jedi, will determine the fate of the galaxy for the next thousand years. True victory in this war will not come through armies, but through the Brotherhood of Darkness. Our greatest weapon is the Force, and those individuals who have the power to command it. Individuals like you. He paused to let his words sink in before continuing. You are special, Des. You have many remarkable talents. These talents are manifestations of the Force, and they have served you well as a soldier. But you have only scratched the surface of your gift. The Force is real. It exists all around us. You can feel the power of it in this room. Can you sense it? So um, it's this moment that a mentor comes in and usually tells the hero, you're special. There's more to you than you realize. You're, you're capable of doing great things. But here we have a dark lord telling it to our, who will be this, this great villain. But he's our protagonist for right now. Mm-hmm. For right now still. And, and, and Kopesh is the, is the Twi'lek, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Twi'lek. Okay. So in the beginning of the prologue, we saw a couple of these uh, these Sith Lords talking about Korriban there in the Academy. And this mm-hmm. is where Dez is. They brought him to Korriban. The power of the dark side, the heat of passion and emotion, I can feel it in you as well, burning beneath the surface, burning like your anger. It makes you strong. And it's like it's like Apatros where, where he was found. You know, Apatros is, I said that we're going to come back to this theme of impenetrability, of hardness is a theme that goes through not only this book, but all of the, the books in the trilogy. And uh, Apatros, the, the the hot, sweltering, inhospitable mining planet, is is kind of a metaphor for Des himself. He's got that burning, inhospitable anger, rage, and passion within him. But he uh, he mines it like he would mine Apatros, the uh, the cor- the cordite on Apatros. He, uh, he mines his anger and his passion and his dark side emotions within him to use them effectively you know a real dangerous sith lord des felt his heart pounding his head swimming as long as he could remember he'd known he was special because of his unique talents and now he was being told that his abilities were nothing compared with what he could really accomplish again a turning on its head of the mentor telling the hero you're special he recalled one of the last things groshik had ever said to him don't count on others for help in the end each of us is in this alone the survivors are those who know how to look for themselves look out for themselves Everything he had uh, given to his unit, he'd saved their lives too, many times to count, too many times to count. In the end, when the enforcers had come to take him away, they'd been powerless to save him. They would have tried if he'd let them, but they would have failed. Des realized the truth. His unit, his friends could do nothing for him now. He could rely only on himself, like always. He'd be a fool to turn this opportunity down. I am honored, Master Kopej, and I gratefully accept your offer. So Master Kopej tells him that uh, Sith, coming into the academy will often take a new name because to, sh- to symbolize the shedding of their old lives and coming into this new life here. And uh, do you wish to choose a new name for yourself, Des? Kopesh asked, um, possibly sensing his reluctance. Do you wish to be reborn? So, so to- Kopesh asked him, I want to read this. This is a new beginning for you, Des, a new life. Many of the students who come here take a new name for themselves. They leave their old life behind. Des had no desire to hang on to any part of his old life. An abusive father, the brutality of working, the minds of Apatros, he had been seeking a new life for as long as he could remember. The Gloomwalkers had offered an escape, but it had been a temporary one. Now he had the chance to leave his past behind forever. All he had to do was embrace the Brotherhood of Darkness and its teachings. And yet, for reasons he couldn't explain, he felt the cold grip of fear closing in on him. That fear made him hesitate. Do you wish to choose a new name? Uh, Kopesh says, Des nodded. Kopesh smiled once more. And by what name shall we call you now? The fear would not stop him. He would seize the fear, transform it, and make it his own. He could take what had once made him weak and use it to make himself strong. My name is Bane, Bane of the Sith. So uh, they don't go by Darth or anything at this point. We'll get to where that comes from later. But uh, but Bane, the name that his father called him as he abused him and tried to belittle him. You're the Bane of my existence. You know, that kind of thing. He takes on that name. And we'll see throughout the next chapter, even before we finish up with the reading tonight, that he does do that. He takes that fear inside him and uses that as power. Like I said, he mines it like he would have done Coruscant on uh, keep saying that word wrong on a Patros but yeah I mean I, I, I like the fact I like the fact that he he took that which was meant to be an insult mm-hmm. you know something to degrade him and now yeah. he's going to turn it into the most feared <laughs> thing the name the, a name that will will cause fear he's twisted yeah. it yeah 
yeah, twisted it. So he's, uh, you know, even well, I'll, I'll get to it when he says it. But the idea is that he's going to become your bane. If you want to call mm -hmm. him the bane of your existence, fine. He'll be the bane of He'll your be existence. He'll the bane of, every, you know, of everyone's existence. Exactly, exactly. Then at the end of chapter eight, we get this cool little scene of Lord Kopej, the, uh, the, the Dark Lord who just brought Bane into the to the academy there. And he's going to talk to Lord um, Cordis, who is the head of the academy. Lord Cordis was the one at the prologue who was staying there to run the academy on Korriban. And remember that we talked about the Sith at this point, the Emperor's been slain, and they're trying this out now because they realize that the problem with uh, with the council, the Dark Council, and all this kind of stuff is that they're that as because they're Sith, they're always stabbing each other in the back. They're always too busy fighting each other that it makes a problem for fighting the Republic. So their answer at this point is to call something the the Brotherhood of the Sith. So all of the Sith lords are kind of equal. You know, it's like the Sith democracy, which sounds really silly as we even yeah. say it. And uh, and it's you know we'll see the problems with it as we go well, along. So, well, like like I said, I equated it to the triumvirate in Rome after the fall of Caesar. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because the emperor was gone. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Everybody's vying for power. So when uh, Copej, we see a little bit of this here, when Copej tells uh, Lord Cordis, you know, I'm bringing the student in, uh, he says, as I told you before, Cordis, he grew up on a Patros, a world controlled by the Oro Company. Cordis says, yet you managed to find this young man and bring him here to the academy. It seems almost too convenient. The heavyset Twilix snarled. This is not a plot against you, Cordis. That is no longer our way. We are a brotherhood now, remember? You are too suspicious. Cordis laughed. Not suspicious, cautious. <laughs> so, got that little uh, uh, suspicions are still there, those tensions. Uh, but he says, um, now they have this little debate because Bane is a little older, you know, and they usually take in people earlier, as uh, Cordis says. But Kopesh says, now you sound like a Jedi. They seek the young and younger pup pupils, hoping to find them pure and innocent. In time, they will refuse any who are in, or who are not infants. You know, as we'll see eventually, we must be quick to pluck those they leave behind. Besides, he continued, Bane is too strong to simply pass over, even for the Jedi. We are lucky we found him before they did. And uh, Cordis later on says he is that strong, is he? This Bane, Kopej nodded. I think he might be the one we've been searching for. He could be the Sithari, the Sitari. Before he can claim that title, Cordis said with a cunning smile, he'll have to survive this training. So a little bit of a tease there. Um, there's a something, yeah. some kind of prophecy, right? Yeah, because and, and I'm thinking it's it's like a, it's like a direct uh, analogy to the Jedi's chosen one, which was exactly. Anakin, Anakin to bring balance to the Force. Mm -hmm. I guess they think that the Sithari, the Sithari, or Sitari, or Sitari, uh, is that a similar? Kind of, I know we haven't gotten to. Yeah, it's a similar like one bringing balance to the Sith, basically, kind of you know, or stopping the the infighting. As we'll see, I mean, we know from just Star Wars history, we know the rule of two is basically what does this, you know. So, um, but so, not yeah. always. But 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 much like uh, the chosen one of the Jedi may not exactly come the way they believe or would exactly. want. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Prophecies are never fulfilled exactly the way you think they're going to, right? Yeah. Uh, and I've saw, I saw somebody in the chat was talking about the the similarities between this structure in, in like Harry Potter, right? And that's not it's not a similarity to Harry Potter. It's a similarity to the hero's journey. So you're right in pointing out that you know Rowling was absolutely taking the hero's journey there with with Harry. You know, you're a wizard, Harry. You know, as, as Hagrid first tells him, and then Dumbledore and so forth. Uh, there's more to you than you think there is. Uh, you know, and then having this idea that you're a uh, you're a chosen one in some way. You know, King Arthur. You know these kinds of stories that you you don't you don't even know it yet, but there's you're, there's some sort of prophecy that you're going to fulfill. Uh, but Carbishan is twisting it on its head and using it with a villain here. Now I, I know I said that, uh, and I, I still hang in there with me because we're only in the first uh, ten chapters with this week's reading. Eventually, we are going to get over though into other characters. Like I said, one reason why this story isn't a an example of just yet another story that glories in a villain is because he's not our only protagonist. We're going to start out with him for a pretty heavy time to get us established with him and what he's going through and what he's ha what's happening around him. But then we'll find out other characters, even the uh, Republic soldiers and Jedi, who we're actually going to quite ca care about quite a bit and follow. So uh, that's there. And then also at no point, I mean, even with the Gloomwalkers, like we said, at his most quote unquote redeemable moment, he's still full of the dark side. He's still, you know, a, a dark character, even though he's kind of caring about his shoulders and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, he, he's a bad guy. He, yeah, he, yeah. He's, he was born bad. I mean, he was, yeah. 
like like they say he was born under a bad star or whatever. You know. <laughs> and and any you never root for him. The only reason you would root for him in a specific scene is because, as I said, people around him are being even more despicable than he is. Mm -hmm. Uh he's told that if his, his lessons start, he's told the Sith um the Sith mantra, peace is a lie, there's only passion. Through passion I gain strength, through strength I gain power, through power I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken. So he's reciting this to himself, and he's thinking to himself, this is in italics, peace is a lie, there is only passion. He knew the first tenet to be true, at least. His entire life was proof of that. He had never been at peace. And uh, Cordis, I think, tells him here, all right, so they're talking about the academies and the differences of the different academies. Mm -hmm. And this sets up, this gives us an idea of the difference of uh, ranks of Sith, uh, both soldiers but also sith's uh force users they're not all just dark lords you know we we think of that now in terms of the original trilogy and the prequels because of the rule of two but before the rule of two you had different levels of force users from the sith those with noticeable but limited ability are sent to Honiger, gents of our gamora to become sith warriors or marauders they are taught to channel their emotions into mindless rage and battle fury the power of the dark side transforms them into ravaging beasts of death and destruction to be unleashed against our enemies. And Des thinks through passion, I gain strength, Bane thought. But when he uh, spoke again, he says, brute strength alone is not enough to bring down the Republic. True, Cordis agreed. And he says, those with greater ability are sent to worlds they have uh, allied with our cause to destroy the Republic. Ryloth, Umbara, Narshada, their students become creatures of shadow, learning to use the dark side for secrecy, deception, manipulation. Those who survive the training become unstoppable assassins, capable of drawing on the dark side to kill their targets without ever moving a muscle. And then Bane, or Bane says, yet even they are no match for the Jedi, thinking he understood the direction was taking. Precisely as Master agreed, Master Cordis. The academies on Dathomir, Iridonia, are most similar to the one here. Their apprentices study under Sith Masters. Those who succeed in their training become the adepts and acolytes who swell the ranks of our, uh, of our armies. They are the counterparts to the Jedi Knights who stand in the way of their ultimate conquest. But he says, he says, uh, the Jedi Knights must answer to the Jedi Masters, so must the Adepts and Acolytes answer to Sith Lords. And those with the potential to become Sith Lords, and only those with such potential, are trained here on Korriban. So that's the difference. You know, this is the difference of this academy. He's at the top of the top of the top. You know, the academy's an impossible outcome there. He's at Oxford. Harvard, yeah, exactly. Yale or, you know, Stanford. Yeah. <laughs> And he says, um, Cordis tells him about the planet of Korriban, how it's, uh, it's, it's it's brimming with dark side power from its very core, you know, because of its old past with Sith, you know, uh, and dark side force users from ages ago. Now, it makes you wonder if the planet was a source of dark power or because it was populated by Sith that it absorbed the dark power. I think that's the principle from reading the history of the old Republic and stuff like that, because the first, I think the very first force dark force users who broke off from the Jedi landed there first, I believe to find the Sith there. So yeah, they brought that dark force mm. power with them and it's just been so ingrained into the oh, planet. Yeah. Uh, great Sith masters have been buried there. It's burial grounds and whatnot. They're taking all their latent forces with them and stuff. Mm. Um, but, but I like what but, you said about comparing it to Harry Potter. There, there is kind of that little bit of, Thing and you see it and you saw it in Red Harvest too. The, yes, uh, yeah. The uh, interplay between the the acolytes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's you know we're going to see some of that too, like reminiscent of Red Harvest. Now, part of this uh, before Cordis kind of sends him out to be trained at the academy, Cordis uh, cuts his hand where the blood is on his hand, and he touches Bane's head with it as sort of a way to initiate him into the Brotherhood. You know, Cordis reached out and placed his wounded palm on the crown of Bane's bare scalp anointing him with the blood of a Sith Lord. Bane had seen plenty of blood as a soldier, yet for some reason this ceremonial act of self-mutilation revolted him more than any battlefield gore. It was all he could do not to pull away. So he sits there, he goes along with it and everything, but this is telling because Bane is all about what is his theme, what is his mantra, it's all about himself. Trust yourself, nobody else. And the problem, the thing that doesn't match up with Sith philosophy is this idea of the brotherhood is that you have to kind of be for your brother. A brotherhood and so the idea of cutting a palm and initiating like a blood brother kind of ceremony kind of thing mm -hmm. and that that grates on bane bane doesn't you 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 harmed yourself for the sake of initiating another no you don't harm yourself for any other you look out for yourself mm -hmm. totally you know so little hints of bane's discontent with this system 
Um, <clears throat> as he gets into the, to the, we do now we get his beginning here. So we got, we, we met him on a Patros after he'd already begun and been there for a while. We jump in time and meet him as a Sith walk, as a, as a gloom walker with the Sith army. Once he'd already been there, worked up his time. Now we're seeing a beginning in which we're actually there with him. This cues the reader that this is the real beginning that sticks. This is the real bane that we're going to follow now. The other ones were, were vignettes. So a little uh, narrative trick that clues the reader into that. But we also see, we're going to see that uh, repetition of things. Uh, we are going to see him not look at, at first he doesn't go for older technology, but he himself goes to the old scrolls, the old books, mm -hmm. the old lore of the Sith uh, that, that most of the students there just ignore. They want to do the fighting training. But he's at first, he's, he's very, uh, he's behind everybody in such a competitive, ruthless environment. He would be an easy target for another student. But as he mulled it over, he began to realize he might not be as vulnerable as he thought. He alone of all apprentices at the academy had been able to manifest the power of the dark side without any training at all. Um, so then talking about the archives, because the collection was constantly being added to, the indexes and references were hopelessly out of date because the Jedi keep trying to destroy any archives of the Sith. Searching the archives was often an exercise in futility or frustration, and most students felt their time was better spent trying to learn or impress their masters. Perhaps it was because he was older than most of the others, or maybe because his years of mining had taught him patience. Whatever the explanation, Bain spent several hours each day studying the ancient records. And we're going to see the uh, records he actually studies the most are ones from Revan, when Revan was still uh, duped into being a dark lord, you know, that Revan actually left a lot of you know, uh, instructions in the dark path. Bane felt that in time, the ancient knowledge would be the key to unlocking his full potential. So we first have Bane, uh, Dez, stuck with old mining equipment that causes him trouble. Then we see De Dez choosing an older model of, of rifle because he's, he's good with it. Now we see him actually seeking out older knowledge because that's going to serve him more than anything else. So this repetition of, of uh, what, the, what was old is actually better. What was, you know, mm -hmm. don't, don't let it... Uh, trip you up but we grab what was old don't just discard it we're gonna see that right. theme develop and it's also you know the wisdom of the of the older you have these young yeah. these young punks basically <laughs> try who who think you know if i learn you know i'll learn my lightsaber and then i'll be able to kick everyone's mm -hmm. you know behind exactly exactly but bane knows there's more to it mm -hmm. there's a lot more in, in the mind and the intellect and in in his intelligence beyond just the physical ability of the mm -hmm. with the lightsaber yeah 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 and uh bane is um what we're gonna see that develop as we go through it's gonna be interesting one thing i want to uh dwell on now though at the end of this chapter we get a jump to a different scene this is a scene elsewhere where the Sith and Republic are having this space battle. And we we did get mentioned, we haven't talked about it here, but there was mention of Lord Khan. Lord Khan is the Dark Lord who's in charge of the actual army. He's like the general out there on the front lines. And we see in this battle, Lord Khan is sitting in his uh, meditation sphere out there in the space battle, and he's using his uh, force meditation, battle meditation, to help the cause. Now, battle meditation, we've talked about this on my channel uh, with the Knights of the Old Republic playthrough and Bastila was adapted. Odin Ur was, I think, the first one in recorded history anyway to talk about it, um, you know. But Jedi use battle meditation very differently than, than Sith use battle meditation. A Jedi uses battle meditation to strengthen their allies, to let me strengthen uh, my soldiers with confidence, with, with capability, with uh, getting them to work in unison. Um, you know, you're strengthening your side. Sith use battle meditation very differently. Um, drawing on the dark side of the force to influence the outcome of a conflict despite his physical exhaustion. The art of battle meditation, a weapon passed down from the ancient Sith sorcerers, drew the enemy ranks into chaos, feeding their fear and hopelessness, crushing their hearts and spirits with bleak despair. Every false move by the opponent was magnified. Every hesitation was transformed into a cascade of errors and mistakes overwhelmed even the most disciplined troops. The battle that had only just begun and it was already all but over. So dark, uh, the dark use sword side user's medita battle meditation is more about attacking the enemy than it is building up their own side. This will change slightly once we get to Palpatine, and we read through in the in the uh, Thrawn trilogy, for example, that uh, Jeru Sabiath, the clone there, uh, Thrawn tried to get him to exert this 
battle meditation. Now he was using it to strengthen their side, but in the sense of making their soldiers zombies. Let me just clear their heads out and make them do exactly what I want them to do, which isn't, you know, exactly the, the way to do it either in terms of a light side. But uh, Lord Khan is going up against this battle and suddenly his battle meditation stops working. And he realizes there's a Jedi, there's a master Jedi somewhere using her battle meditation <clears throat> against him. So Lord Kopej, the, the heavy set Twilik who brought who brought Bane into the the, the uh, order there to, on Korriban, decides to go crash into this Jedi ship. And we see some mm. of the Kopej's real competence here. A little oppressive. He crashes right into the ship and, and breaks free and uh, is, is hunting down the Jedi who's doing the, the battle meditation against them. I gotta give it. It, it remind. It, it kind of reminds me of the old days when the when your general actually fought with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's there in an interceptor fighting alongside the other Sith troops. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's something. There's something to be said about that. that takes uh, that takes some guts. You gotta mm -hmm. you gotta give it to the old toilet. Yeah, <laughs> toilets are, are pretty uh, pretty ruthless. He ends up fighting through what I think is funny: some Selkath Jedi. You know, Selkath, we've met them in Knights of the Old Republic. But he goes in and he meets the, the Jedi that he's looking for. It's an elderly Syrian female. Remember um, Kuati Mundi, Master Kuati Mundi, the conehead Jedi in the prequels? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a Syrian. So this is oh, an okay. elderly Syrian female. And uh, she's there in meditation, right? She has to be, you know, as we see Lord Khan, even when he was in meditation, you have to focus. You're, you're, um, you're in a trance, basically. And it says an elderly serene female clad in the temple brown robes of a Jedi master was seated cross-legged on the floor. Her creased and wrinkled face was bathed in sweat from the strain of using her battle meditation against uh, Khan and the Sith. Exhausted, drained, she was no match for the Sith Lord who loomed above her. Yet she made no move to flee or even defend herself. With certain death only seconds away, she kept her mind and power focused entirely on the fleet battle. Kopej could not help but admire her courage, even as he methodically cut her down. And this is an example of the of the light side is all for others. That Syrian uh, Jedi Master, she was not going to be able to defend herself. She could maybe try to scooch away and try to prolong her death, but she was going to die in that moment. So she would rather use every last moment she had to help her her fellow you know Republic soldiers out there, rather than try and eke out a few more minutes of her life. You know, <clears throat> the, the the drastic opposite, polar opposite of the Sith. You know, so um. So it's neat that we see those two those two combinations there, uh, and then of course that once her battle meditation is no longer in operation, Lord Khan's kicks in and, and they win that battle. Yeah. Chapter ten, our last chapter for tonight, gives us a little bit more traction on Bane's uh, Bane's um, progress in the academy. We we do learn about the different forms of the uh, of the um, lightsaber. Fight, fighting and Drew Carpishan again was one of the writers you know that helped with Knights of the Old Republic so he's bringing in a lot of that there were different forms that you could learn and stuff like that in the Knights of the Old Republic games um, Lord uh, Kasim is the Sith Lord who's the Blade Master he chooses for De or for Bane I keep saying Des now he's Bane now for Bane he chose the uh, Demso form 5 the 5th form emphasized strength and power allowing Bane to use his size and muscles to best advantage only after he was able to perform each of the moves of them, so to, so to the satisfaction of Kasim, he'd allowed to be again formal training. So he's uh, he's training, he's working, he's he's doing quite well actually. Uh, then we get to the scene, which this is what's reminiscent of Red Harvest. I'm sure you thought about this too, when all of the the acolytes are there and they can call each other out in a challenge. Right. Know? Yeah. We started with that scene in Red Harvest. And uh, it says that Bane, a few people challenged him at first because it's a way to get to gain prestige. They don't kill each other. They use practice sabers that are uh, poison barbs on it to where if it slashes you, your wherever it slashes you goes temporarily numb. So like if it slashes your arm, your arm goes temporarily numb to mimic the effects of a lightsaber actually hacking your arm off and it being unable to use in the in the uh, battle. But they don't kill people in these uh in the in these battles. It's just a way to gain prestige. So people had tried to call out Bane a couple times when he was first there, but he denied it. He reclined it. You know, it, uh, better to look like a coward than, than to, to lose prestige right away, you know. But one of the people who had called him out and actually bested him was uh, Foharg, the McCurth. Let me look this up and show you guys what a McCurth is, because it's pretty uh, pretty wicked looking. Um, yeah, the description there is like pretty, pretty big guy. Mm -hmm, yeah. 
big dude. Let me show you here. Share, share screen. And, and it says a little bit like a uh, Trendocean, but like Bosk, you know, from uh, from from Empire Strikes Back, the the bounty hunter. But they're different. They've got these four horns, and and I mean, that's that's one wicked looking dude coming at you right there. Really? Um, <laughs> speaks really snake like and everything, and yeah, so it, it's uh, yeah, not to be messed with. So um, he comes after him, and they have this this battle, and uh, Bane actually actually does pretty well against him, and it looks like he's actually going to best for uh, for Hart. For, Foharg. 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 He wouldn't say yeah. Fogar, but Foharg. Um, Foharg is, uh, but but slips away and eventually comes back in, in the uh, in the battle a little bit and ends up slicing Dez's shoulder, his right shoulder, which makes his whole right arm go numb and he drops his practice saber. And Dez hasn't learned how to use a lightsaber from both uh, both hands yet. So this, let me read it because this is really telling how this works. Um, Folk, uh, Bane says, "Just finish me. This just finish me, because Fokar is is uh, gloating over him in front of everybody, and uh, this ends when I choose." The McCurth replied, refusing to be baited. The eyes of the other apprentices turned into Bane. He could feel them drinking in his suffering as they stared at him. They resented him. He resented the extra attention he had been receiving from the masters. Now they were re re reveled in his failure. You are weak, Foharg explained, casually twirling his lightsaber in a complex and intricate pattern. You are predictable. Stop it, Bane wanted to scream. End this. Finish me. But despite the emotion building up inside him, he refused to give his opponent the satisfaction of saying another word. Instead, he let it all but useless saber fall from one to the ground. In the background, he could see the Blade Master watching intently. The Masters coast at you. They, they give you extra time and attention, more than the others, more than me. Bane barely even heard the words anymore. His heart was pounding so loud he could hear the blood coursing through his veins, literally quaking with impotent rage. He lowered his head and dropped to one knee, exposing his bare neck. Despite this, you are still my inferior, Bane of the Sith. Bane. Something in the way Foharg said it caused Bane to glance up. It was the same way his father used to say the word. That name is mine, Bane whispered, his voice low and threatening. Nobody uses it against me. Foharg either didn't hear him or didn't care. He took a leisurely step forward. Bane, worthless, an insignificant nothing. The masters wasted their time on you. Time better spent on the other students. You are well named, for you truly are this academy's Bane. No, Bane screamed, thrusting his good hand out palm forward, even as Fogar, Foharg leapt in to finish him off. Dark side energy erupted from his open palm to catch his opponent in midair, hurling him back to the edge of the crowd where he landed at Kasim's feet. Uh, he's, so he's just like torturing in there with the force energy. Enough, Bane, Lord Cassine said in a cold, uh, even voice, though he stood only uh, some meters away, away from the death rows of his student. His eyes were fixed on the one still standing. A final surge of power roared up through the core of Bane's being and exploded out into the world. In response, Foarg's body went stiff and his eyes rolled back in his head. Bane realized, released his hold on the force and his fallen enemy, the McCurse body, went limp, limp as the last vestiges of life ebbed away. Now it's enough, Bane said, turning back to the corpse and walking <laughs> forward. So, uh, so, so he kills him. He kills. He's not supposed to yeah. kill. But we're, we're seeing that happen. What Bane has been happening to him all through the story. It happened to him in the cantina there uh, on Apatros when the force just gets so bottled up in front of him, it just eaves out from him. Uh, we see it happening in um, as in the Gloom Walkers. Now we see it happening at Korriban, and where he actually takes a life with it. And again, it's the same thing. It's like um. Bane is bad. He's he's all for himself. He's selfish. Yet bring in somebody like the McCurth, who's who's just one hundred percent more despicable, you know, to him. And you want him to win. You want Bane to, to win at that point. Uh, at the end of the chapter, we get Bane walking away, and uh, this is a Brack student who's just as favored by the uh, masters as he is. Sirak is his name. Comes up to him and basically tells him, "You were off my radar until today, but now you're on it." And he says, I don't challenge people because I don't uh, I don't need to waste my time proving myself to inferiors. He says, but you will challenge me one day. And when you do, I'll be waiting and whatever. So gets a little tension at the end of a chapter, set up a possible conflict to come. And Zabrak is a Darth Maul. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 
Yeah, Horn this one in head. particular has got like a pale yellow, though. You know? Right. More like Savage Press or somebody like that. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, you know, uh, I see Morgan T. Uh, Dulliman says, reading this as a teenager, this was when I started uh, wanting to be a Sith. <laughs> it's interesting you say as a teenager because the, the academy, that's kind of like high school, you know. There are, um, and, you know, he's going up against a bully in some respect, even though he himself wants to be a bully. Um, so, yeah, you can't help but to invest in the scene, even if you're not necessarily investing in his character or in terms of rooting for him, you know, to, to come out winning and stuff. So it's uh, it's really well done. Now, next, um, the, the chapters we get for next week, we're actually going to start seeing uh, some of the other characters. We're going to actually start going into some of the other, um, you know, uh, other areas of the story and whatnot. But we are going to follow Bane a little bit more just to get his uh, get his um, story there and find out uh, about some of the other students and what's going on there. So um, I do want to share something, uh, a couple things. We're not done yet. I mean, we're done with the book study there. But next week, we're just going to keep doing five chapters. So next week will be chapters 11 through 16. I mean, through 15. 11 through 15. <laughs> Um, five chapters at a time. That's a good, that's a good little section there. Um, I want to share this because it's so awesome. I told sound engraver today that she really needs to put the, uh, all of these great videos she's been releasing from her live streams of the siege of Mandalore. She needs to put them into a, uh, a single playlist and she did. So I'm going to share that here. I'm going to put it in the chat. If you guys haven't, first of all, subscribe to sound engraver. She does do a lot of music stuff on her channel. So if you're not a musician, you might not understand some of that. But she talks a lot about Star Wars. And her critique of Siege of Mandalore is so spot on. And I mentioned the other day, there's the link in the uh, in the chat there. I mentioned the other day in one of my videos about how Siege of Mandalore was ridiculous. I'm still getting people saying, what was wrong with Siege of Mandalore? What was wrong with Siege of Mandalore? <laughs> what are you talking about? They made, Ahsoka Tano might as well have been Rey Skywalker. I mean, it was awful in every respect, not to mention the writing was horrible. I mean, but people are conditioned to like it because their favorite YouTubers or whatever, who are also anti the right things to be anti, you know, want to defend it. So they're like, what's wrong with that? I think Dave Filoni's a chosen one. You know, so um, she does a really great job. I've talked about it on my channel. I haven't had the the uh, patience to go as in-depth and, and meticulously as she has, and she's done that in this playlist. So um, if you haven't subbed to her, you really ought to, but you ought to check out that, uh, that those videos anyway, they really will answer the question of, of the specifics. She gets into specifics too. She's not like me. She won't just rant and rave. She'll actually talk you the specifics. <laughs> <laughs> Problems. Not that I'm a rant and raver as much as other people are, but you know, I get passionate. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did see a lot of people tagging me with uh, with things about the study tonight. So I do want to go back through and just look at a couple that, uh, that are mentioned there. Um, Horizon Talker at one point said, I think it's interesting that he's willing to look for value in old things. That's what really sets him apart as Bane versus the other Sith. You're absolutely right. And we'll see that happen even more so as he talks about the older ways of the Sith a little bit more. Because remember, they're all about this new the brotherhood, you know, aspect. The wisdom of the ancients. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Samuel Proctor says, when you said Bane isn't the real protagonist and were, uh, there were moral protagonists, I thought you meant one guy who follows him around. <laughs> now I know you mean multiple people and more evil. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dakota, so Force Unleashed was the name of the game. Thank you. I knew somebody would eventually uh, remind me of it. I was talking about. Rising Talker said it was clear Dez was unsalvageable after he abandoned his troops. Yeah, exactly. Because that is the one moment, like if you can pick one moment in the story where he was the most "quote unquote" redeemable, it would have been there. But he, he's not, he's not going back to them. He's fine. Well, I don't know if "abandon" is the right <laughs> right word. But, well, I mean, uh, in terms of when he accepts going into Korriban, he decides not to go back to his because because uh, Cortis gave him the opportunity, or Copes yeah. gave him the opportunity to go back, you know, or the chance. Um. Samuel Proctor doesn't think that looked like Bosk at all. I mean, reptilian like like Bosk, like the Trandoshans. Not not uh, yeah, not he didn't look like him in terms of character design much, but reptilian. You know, that's the word. Um, Samuel Proctor says eerie the way it's described how he uses his rage and fear to fuel him. It reminded me of me when playing basketball or sprinting, but instead of rage and fear, it was adrenaline. Yeah, it's interesting that um, you know how the how the dark side works. Of course, in real life, we don't have literal force powers, you know, from our rage, but you can give into it and it can, um, you know, if you're in a physical fight or something, it'll lash out in ways of adrenaline or something like that. But 
but it is the way to the dark side of life too. You know, giving into that fear, anger, and whatnot. It's Sam, too a little going into the race like a slight, a little slight berserker rage. You know, yeah. and you just let it all go. Yeah, yeah. Um, Samuel says, just remember the Zabraka from Iridonia, not Dathomir. And he's trying to say that the Clone Wars said that. No, the Clone Wars show actually does make that distinction. They're brought to Dathomir. In Clone Wars, uh, that even actually uh, actually does say that. Now, if you're not watching carefully, you can kind of just sort of think that they all come from Dathomir. Uh, but no, they're brought from Iridonia to Dathomir to serve the the, the witches there. Um, Wolf Ten Media says, "Not as much as me. I have epic rants on my stream." Yeah, I don't see. That's, that's what I meant. Like in terms of uh, other YouTubers, I'm not a ranter and raver like that. I actually do give reasons, but uh, but my, my better half is even calmer and more precise than I am. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and she loves my prof rants. So, so there you go. Uh, I do have a video that's going to be, I'm going to go ahead and post it right after the stream. Uh, another heroic inspirations video. I've been doing those. This one's on daredevil. So, uh, it's actually from the, the Netflix season one and it does talk about the epic hallway scene. So that's oh, a cool God. one. I just worked on that today. So that's releasing now. That'll be my video in between tonight's stream and tomorrow night's stream. Um, Al, I know uh, Fan Man's not doing a stream tomorrow. He's got Father's no. Day stuff he's doing. But uh, are you doing anything tomorrow in his place? He said you might. I yeah, I don't know where he got that from. But <laughs> uh, I I don't I don't know. It really I'll have to wait till tomorrow night to see what's going on because okay. I I have uh, I have a family member coming into town, so I don't okay. know what tomorrow and tomorrow night's going to be like. Gotcha. But uh, Saturday. Yes, you rewatch. My rewatch Saturday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. We are rewatching Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So join me and, of course, my friends Pacelli's Troy and Nanette, and with our special guests Daniel Heron, Mr. the Birdman himself, and Agent Boomer are going awesome. to be joining us because Close Encounters has, of course, another wonderful soundtrack by John Williams, the absolute undisputed master of soundtracks. Although, although there are a few of them that are getting close right now, but uh, yeah. yeah, one of the close cows, one of the, one of the back in the seventies that, that doo -doo 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 was almost as known as do -do 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 -do. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like the, the X-File theme of the seventies. Uh, yeah, and it's kind of yeah. gotten, you know, it's kind of gotten forgotten as time has gone by, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great movie and I'm really looking forward to it. It's uh have watched it in a while. We are, I, I have I have been asked which one we're watching. It's the one that's 2 hours and 17. There are so many cuts to this. Like it's almost like Blade Runner. There's so many mm -hmm. cuts of yeah. it. Yeah. Mine's 217. Whatever it is, join us. Most of the changes are at the end. Okay. Um, but we'll we'll be fine with it. Okay. That's Saturday. Now, tomorrow night, I'm going to be doing my stream at 10 p.m. again. And tomorrow night, I'm going to be talking about the lack. I'm going to talk about some excellent father figures in our mythology and why why we simply don't have father figures anymore, because it's not in keeping with the left's woke feminists, you know, and so forth. But I'm going to be talking about that. And I'm going to be celebrating some of the cool father figures we had and talking about the great need we have and why mythologically and storytelling speaking, why we need them again. So uh, that'll be my stream tomorrow at 10 p.m. I'll set that up here at some point later. So, uh, yeah, good stuff to come. Good stuff to come. And I've got more videos to come, uh, daily videos, you know, as I'm continuing to do. That's working out pretty well. So far, so good. So mm -hmm. I'm at 15,000 now. That's pretty sweet. That's kind of a celebration mark. Wow. Yeah, almost that's, to 15.1, actually. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So things are progressing uh, well. I got like 260-some. <laughs> You also don't post videos. You're just in it to no, have fun. I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just in it to, to do my thing and socialize. That's what yeah. I do it for. You're a celebrity without even having a big channel. You're, you're right. like Bane. I don't even need the training. I'm just already existing for 14 <laughs> hours. <laughs> I, I am a minor YouTube celebrity. <laughs> you are. You are. Everybody loves Big Al. They, they notice when you're not here. So, um, so yeah, good stuff to come, guys. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. And, um, yeah, that's it. Uh, go watch my video. In fact, I will um, – I'll just post it right after I end the stream so, so you'll be able to watch it. But thanks for hanging out with us. And until next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the stories you love. I have nothing.